So it's great to speak with you, Caitlin. Always great to speak with you. I just uh, thought it might be interesting for our supporters to know, how did you first come across our work and what was it that really engaged you, interested you and made you want to get involved? Yeah, sure. For me, I think it was about 2010. And at the time I was a young mum, I had three very young kids. Mm -hmm. And I guess I feel like what I loved about Collective Shout was that these were a bunch of women who were doing and saying the things that I wanted to say, but I didn't feel before like I had the words to say. So I felt like, oh, I finally found my people. Like they get it and I, I don't feel alone. I feel supported and like there's just all these other people, all these other women who mm. understand these issues, who are articulating well what, what is going on and what's the problem and just giving language to how I felt and feeling like we could actually make changes. We didn't have to just sort of tolerate the casual sexism and the objectification of women. We could speak out and we could make changes. And that was uh, very appealing to me. Yeah, that's great to hear. You started out in the early days running a campaign against pornified t-shirts. I recall, I think if I'm right, that that was probably the first campaign you'd been involved in. What took you from running a campaign against porny t-shirts to now being a PhD candidate, being recognised for your, your global expertise on sex dolls and robots? Like that's quite the journey. How, how did you <laughs> land there? Yeah, that's a great question um, without a, a great answer, I suppose. I, I, I don't know how it happened. I, I guess once I became involved with all of you and started working in this space and making connections between different things, between attitudes towards women and behaviours mm -hmm. and how the wider culture shapes attitudes, I guess it was just this journey from there. And uh, I, I suppose just, just working You're all in the space. interconnected, right? Yeah, the it really is. Patient women yeah, on a T-shirt sure. takes us there, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's all incremental. Mm. 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 Well, that's great. Well, we're really proud of you doing this PhD and mm -hmm. look forward to seeing the end result and you probably look forward to finishing it. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the new benchmark. Just, just finish it. Just don't die. Just get through. How, how long have you got to do it? <laughs> I'm a bit over halfway through, um, mm. but then I'm part-time at the moment. So right. we'll see how it goes. Um, maybe another couple okay. of years. But yeah, yeah, it's one of those things that I really don't think I would have gotten there without without you and Melinda L and our brilliant team just feeling really supported throughout. It's it's one of those things you just, you don't do it alone. You just, you draw mm. support from all the people around you and particularly from our great team. That's been- yes so important how have you dealt with like the mental stress of what you've had to expose yourself to you know I know the whole team has been really knocked around especially I felt like like late last year some of the some of the replica child abuse dolls and the replica child body parts and you know being sent videos of of what you could do to a replica baby um, you know, I know we were all quite fragile by the end of last year, and it was a massive year anyway. We had 17 wins in a row. But how do you deal with that soul cost, that psychological trauma of, of what you expose yourself to? Yeah, I think that's something that, as you said, we all kind of struggle with and we all have to deal with. And, mm -hmm. and you're right, when we were looking at things like child sex abuse dolls, some of the content on Pornhub, rape, child abuse, all of those things. It's really the worst humanity has to offer. And that's, we're in that all the time. We're, we're looking at those horrible things. And I think even, well, especially with the, the porn and things associated with that, it's, it's intensely painful because it's this, it's, it's realizing that so many men find pleasure and enjoyment in the degradation of women and, and being a woman and being in that space and just thinking it, it's just such a betrayal and that's really hard to deal with. I think one of the things that's been helpful for me is just having the team to debrief with. If we didn't have our regular debriefs, mm. I think mm. I would struggle a lot. Other than that, a lot of chocolate, really. <laughs> 
Yeah, we need to get onto that chocolate sponsorship. Hey, corporate yes, social responsibility do. pledge. Where is the chocolate company? That is our next campaign. <laughs> I think so. I'm, I'm starting the petition right now. <laughs> I will support that. I, uh, I really so resonate with <laughs> I really resonate with what you're saying, Caitlin, because just yeah. before we came on this call, I was reading the testimonials of young women. There's like 4,000 of them now who have described what boys, primarily in New South Wales, although the petition has expanded now, uh, have done to them. And the trauma, it was like reading this, um, the collected trauma of, of young women describing what happened to them at the hands of young men. And while I, you know, I support and speak to the importance of uh, consent and respectful relationships, it seems to me that a lot of these young men weren't interested in consent, in fact, quite the opposite. And it seems to me that these boys are being socialised and taught by the biggest education department in the world, and that's the porn industry. Story after story indicated to me that these, these young men were being schooled by the global industrialised, commercialised, commodified industry, which trains them, teaches them how to view women and girls. So for those boys, I don't feel like consent would have had any effect because they wanted the opposite of consent. That's where their sexual pleasure and gratification would lie, is in denial of consent, which is what so much of, of porn is about. And it is difficult to, to process that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think as you've said, it's the idea that we just talk about consent, like the answer to everything is just consent education. I don't really know how, how helpful that is when we're not talking about pornography, when we're not talking about how men and boys are socialized through pornography to, to see sexualized violence against women and cruelty and humiliation as erotic. So if we're not talking about those things or pornography as a huge driver, then I don't really think consent education is going to accomplish very much. But MTR, you're in schools all the time with, with young people, with girls and with boys. What, what's that experience like for you? What have you, do you, are you hopeful? What have you learned? Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, thanks for asking, Caitlin. I, I love being in schools and I was enjoying it very much up until I lost the bulk of my schoolwork last year and you know I have Daniel working with me now who, who you know as well and you know we had a, a year mapped out that we were looking forward to but thankfully the work is slowly trickling back in what, what I particularly enjoy is seeing young women joining the dots and recognizing that they don't have to put up with this behavior and that they can stand up for themselves they have a right to say no and they can set their boundaries according to their, their values and that no one should make them feel bad about doing that. So I love seeing that evolution in a, in a session where it's like this, uh, this key critical moment for them where they realise that they have, they have rights, that they should be respected, they should be valued, they shouldn't be treated like a piece of meat. And that, that's... A profound experience to witness that also to realize when they you see that they realize they can engage in cultural change and that they don't need to be passive victims of this culture and they are inspired by other young women who are bringing about social transformation at, at a grassroots level so that's just a wonderful thing to experience i've also been encouraged by meeting more good young men for which i'm grateful young men who say, I can see how porn is harming me. I can see how toxic and harmful stereotypes about masculinity are harming me, my ability to have healthy relationships, to have healthy friendships. And when you meet young men like that, who have decided to break away from the pack, to break away from the mob mentality and not go along with these very embedded socially constructed ideas about how men and boys should act in the world it's very refreshing and that's why it's been great to have Daniel involved because he really speaks to helping young men be their best selves 
to rise above the, the sludge of a sick society and aspire to something better for their lives. And I really think this is where the hope lies is in building a new generation of, of men uh, who will not tolerate these kind of dehumanizing, debasing, degrading, callous, um, brutal behaviors anymore. Yeah, that's the dream, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen Daniel speak on a number of occasions. He's a great speaker mm. and he's really switched on. Uh, so yes. I'm so glad that you guys are working together. But the other thing that I really like, just everything you describe about girls starting to realize that they don't have to go along with this, that they can resist this toxic culture. The thing is, that is what empowerment actually looks like. We keep hearing that uh, sexually objectifying women is empowering and commodifying women's bodies is empowering and everything is empowering and it, the word has become meaningless. But then I think of you going into schools and talking to girls and helping them to have a better understanding of this culture and how this, this sexualized and objectifying culture, how it harms them and how they can change things. And, and yeah. girls feeling like they, they can actually say no, they can actually have boundaries and they didn't feel that before. That to me is precisely what real empowerment actually is. Well, thanks for saying that, Caitlin. And obviously I, I believe the same thing and it really is a, a privilege to see those lights go on. So hopefully uh, that work will resume. Daniel and I have our first event actually in Albury, Victoria in a couple of weeks. We also have a week in, in WA and a few other events finally coming together. Yes, looking <laughs> forward to seeing you and Lynn in WA. Any excuse to see you? I was wondering, Caitlin, you know, reflecting on our 10th anniversary, which we celebrated uh, last year, I'm wondering, is there a, a moment that stands out for you in those 10 years? Was there a campaign that especially resonated for you uh, or is it just all the fun that, you know, you and L ML have uh, causing havoc. Uh, it, it, what, what is it that really stands out for you? Well, I mean, I do love the women that I work with and particularly mm. Melinda Leshevsky. We have a lot of fun and, and yes. you know, we need to debrief during this work. We need to sort of find things to laugh about and lighten the mood when we're looking at so many awful things that are really quite draining. Uh, so I do really love our team and I've loved, you know, the times mm. we've been able to get together in person and catch mm. up and collaborate and spend time and, and do things. That's always so lovely. And I, yes. think, I think that's, yeah, that's what's gotten me through a lot of this. But in terms of specific campaigns, it's we've had so many campaigns and so many victories over the years. And some of them have been kind of fun and quick. And others have been really satisfying when we have, uh, when, when we've won them because the change is so significant. <clears throat> so one of the ones that I think that I do kind of look back with quite a bit of fondness was, uh, I think it was two years ago uh, when we were challenging 7-Eleven and Bauer Media over their people and picture magazines. Now these were pornographic magazines sold in, 7-Eleven and BP and other places that mm. sexualized teen girls and encouraged sexual harassment. And they were really just incredibly sexist and demeaning and degrading. And uh, I remember all of us actually being together, which is rare, but all of us being together, I, I think mm. in Brisbane, because we were there for the Australian Summit Against Sexual Exploitation, which was held in Parliament House in Brisbane. Mm. And we're mm. all sitting around a table in our hotel room and there's, mm. you know, horrible magazines stashed around the place and chocolate stashed around the place. And we're all just together on Twitter, tweeting out the worst of this content, exposing the magazine, yes. exposing the publisher saying, here's the horrible, indefensible content in your magazine. Here's where you're literally advertising pornographic DVDs featuring yeah. a child, featuring un an underage girl, all these kind of things, just pointing out here's exactly what's going on. And all yes. of us being around the table doing it at the same time, I think it was been within an hour or so, um, mm -hmm. MTR, that you got either an email or, or a message mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the head of Bauer Publishing saying, can we meet? And, That's uh, right. It was shortly <laughs> after, maybe it was even before that, 7-Eleven had already decided to pull the magazines and then BP. Yes. And then uh, you met with Bauer Media and they basically said, yeah, there's really no defense for publishing this content 
in yes. 2019, I think it was. A great moment. Like I couldn't wait to get out of his office and tell you what had happened. You know, it's, it's just so rare that you would have a CEO of a, of a corporation saying, you know, everything that you have said is true. Everything you've said is correct. You know, I went into those offices prepared to make my argument and I had all my notes and everything. And he just looked me in the eye and said, you know, it's indefensible that we would still be publishing these, uh, you know, sexist magazines in the 21st century. And he said that he had notified uh, staff that they would cease publishing. So that was three Bauer titles that we got rid of yeah. because uh, earlier we'd got rid of Zoo, the so-called Lads Mag, yeah. uh, which, you know, you would have seen in supermarkets and 7-Eleven and petrol stations. You know, you walk into a petrol station now, uh, three porn magazines have gone because of collective shout you know, zoo picture and people. And they used to be at children's eye level next to the lollies beside the counter. And, you know, mostly they're not anymore. And I was going to pick that one too. <laughs> so I was going to say, what about that's, you? That's just one of my, you know, all time favorites. Yeah. Uh, there yeah. are a lot. And it's wonderful now having this flashback Friday, every Friday where we celebrate a past victory because we've had so many that there's some that I'd kind of forgotten, you know, mm, uh, the Link Stinks campaign that was really a lot of fun. Um, some of the very quick victories that we've had in two or three hours, thanks to social media, which is, you know, it's there's so many issues around social media, but, you know, social media has helped us to have so many uh, victories and often very quick victories. And um, also I think what I find encouraging is the work we're doing globally now with our global partners, our friends at Encozy, Exodus Cry and others uh, running huge campaigns and it's been so fantastic to see what's happening now with Pornhub finally, MindGeek, the owners of Pornhub being brought to account before the Canadian Ethics Committee. Uh, that's because of a global effort exposing the trafficking, the rape videos, the image-based abuse, you know, the, the, the underage girls being turned into fodder for this global industry worth billions of dollars. So that gives me hope as well. And the work we're doing now with online platforms, uh, Alibaba and Amazon and uh, eBay, and how responsive they've been to the content that we have exposed uh, of course, Etsy has been a lot slower. Hello, Etsy, where are you? Crazy. Ignoring our campaign, ignoring our petition with 40,000 signatures. Why, why does Etsy want to keep flogging child sex abuse dolls, replica child body parts and other absolutely abhorrent material? And destroying uh, their I brand in the process. Right. Hello, Etsy had a, you know, a nice image. Um, bespoke, vintage, homemade, arty all of those things and they've they've allowed the trashing of their brand and not done anything to address that so we are still waiting to hear uh, from Etsy but you know I think we've got clout now at a, a global level um, which I don't know that I imagined 10, 10 years ago. Yeah that's what I was going to ask I was going to say going back to 10 years ago being in a room with with a handful of women and this whole vision could you have ever anticipated yeah. where no. we are now? No, I just had this crazy idea. Uh, I thought, well, what had happened was, I, for those who don't know the history, I'd, I'd written my book, Getting Real, Challenging the Sexualization of Girls, published by Spinifex Press. And it documented the harms of sexualizing girls. It brought together authorities in the field, in Australia and internationally. So people started contacting me and saying, well, where's the movement against everything you've just described? What can we do about it? And I thought, yeah, we need some kind of collective uprising here. And we need a grassroots movement to counter these harms. And one of the contributors to the book, Tanya Andrusiak, wrote to me and said, your book is a collective shout against the pornification of culture. Those words leapt out at me. I thought I needed an excuse to use those words. I'll start this movement. So I got some mates together. Uh, Melinda L, obviously, one of the first I contacted, probably the first I contacted because I knew she'd be into it. And uh, I think it was about half a dozen women got together in Canberra with a whiteboard and we just thrashed out what did we want this organisation to look like? 
happen. But even back then, I did not imagine we'd be operating at the global level that we are now. You know, we're still just a small team and people think we're much bigger than we actually are. You know, keep that a secret. <laughs> I think you just blew it. We are out there every day, you know, <laughs> punching above our weight. We've got thousands of people involved now. We've been asked to set up globally. Um, so, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't see that. I didn't envision that. Didn't all. anticipate our no, participation really. in campaigns against Pornhub and our, our role in MasterCard and Visa pulling, uh, uh, stopping the processing of payments on that platform, things that we have directly mm -hmm. been involved in. Yeah, I didn't. Mostly back then we were focused on, you know, sexualized clothing for children, uh, you know, billboards, other types of advertising. Um, but yeah, it's just been great to see our work expanding and being recognized globally. And now, you know, you're doing your PhD, you become recognized on the sex dolls and robots issue. Uh, we're seen as a serious, serious uh, organization in the whole porn research space um, and in the activism space, the campaigning space, because we're all activists at heart, really. Uh, even though we're doing doing some academic work and we do high level submissions and we appear before federal inquiries and state inquiries, we're still you know campaigners at, at heart, mm. and it's just been great to I suppose bring all those elements together in this global grassroots movement now. Sure, and one of the things mm. I've I've noticed uh, in the last few months, I've been looking back over past campaigns and victories just just through different mm. things. And some of it is, uh, I guess, uh -oh. just looking back. Did you, got this? Did you see yeah. that message? Yeah. <laughs> okay, love it. I All think right. we're saying we have more time. Renee, you'll have Renee. to edit this. The message okay. just came up. <laughs> and we just come back to that. <laughs> uh, I've been yeah. going over some of the past wins and campaigns, you know, for the last 10 years, just recently. And something yes. that struck me is that we've really come such a long way because when you look mm. back at some of the early campaigns, I just think I can't believe this was everything. I can't believe these companies could be so brazenly sexist and yeah. hating. And yeah. it's, I feel like it's because we have called them out that mm. we have resisted. We have provided opposition for all these years yeah. that that's not the same anymore. I mean, obviously there, there is still sexist advertising and sexually objectifying advertising. I mean, look at Honey Burdett, yeah. for example. Yeah, but I, I look at things. Yeah, I look mm. at things like links, campaigns, and and just yeah. different things. And I think, how did they get away with that? It was so bad. And now I we're know. here yeah. working in this space, yeah. and I feel like the culture has changed. It's not yeah. okay anymore. Like like you said, when we go to the corner stores and you look, you know, the petrol stations used to be dominated by pornographic magazines, often at, at kids' eye level, and it's just not the same now. Most of the time, there's nothing. When I go, and I think that's in large part because of well, it is because we've shut down three of them. So yeah, I think that's right. a testament to our work and how effective yeah, we've no, been in no. changing that culture. I agree. I think there has been a cultural shift. I know when I first started doing this work, even the term sexualization wasn't in the public lexicon. Uh, the harms of porn, you know, we were mocked, we were made fun of, there was memes made about us. Uh, we were told we were. Pearl clutches, for example, uh, which is ironic because actually we have an auction right now. And uh, funnily enough, I have some pearls that are being auctioned. So, you know, maybe I am a pearl clutcher. Uh, support the auction, just by the way, uh, you can find out about it on our website. But, you know, all these names and now everything we were saying has come true. You know, mm. every day I hear from parents saying, this is what happened to my child, you know, unintended unwanted exposure to porn, mm. uh, girls being sexually harassed, even at school being groped, even at primary schools, boys demanding the sex acts they've seen in porn. Everything we said back then has happened tragically. Mm. You know, what a, what a tragedy that we were right. Uh, but yeah, we're not made fun of so much anymore, not in the same way as we were back then. Yeah. And it's the issue is now being treated more seriously. Yeah, for sure. Where would you like to see us in 10 years' time, Caitlin? You better still be with us, by the way. <laughs> I would like to see us with 
lots more funding uh basically okay. bigger well, well funding equals bigger funding means we can yes. we can run more campaigns we can be involved i guess we look at we do submissions on one hand we do activism we mm. are in school so we have all these different components and i just mm. feel like each one of those could be much broader it could be bigger we could be doing much yes. more i would love to see I just think of particularly the girls in schools and, and the boys that, that you speak to. And I think, I wish something like that had been around when I was younger. I wish I had heard from yeah. the MTR when I was younger and how my life might've been different in ways. And I just mm. think it would be so good if that was the norm, if everyone mm. could hear from MTR and collect a shout in oh. their schools, things like that, that I think, oh, if we could do so much, mm. uh, basically, well, Really, I guess I would love for us not to be needed anymore because the world is different. We've um, abolished the porn industry and, mm. and, uh, and women mm. are no longer considered sexual objects. Uh, but yeah, that might take longer than 10 years. But I guess that's the dream really is that we don't need to be still fighting in this space because the culture has changed. What about you? I can't do better than what you've said. Just what she said, what, what Caitlin just said yeah same same yeah not to be needed to see uh, more and more young people standing up for themselves and speaking out and yeah funding uh, so if you'd like to support us we are tax deductible and you can visit <laughs> our auction we are announcing on international women's day march the 8th the uh, winning bids for our auction but yeah we need serious long-term sustainable funding to to keep in this game this wasn't meant to be a fundraising pitch but hey we've got nothing to lose so uh there you go <laughs> caitlin it's just a pleasure i love working with you i'm so glad you're part of the team i'm so glad you found us uh, 10 10 years ago and uh onward and upward and all the best with the phd Thank you. And I, I feel the same. I love all the women I work with. I feel so glad that that I found you all and that we yes. have come together and that we're fighting this fight together. That's it. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Oh, I found that interesting. I hope everyone else does. <laughs>